The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 5136 in the name of Marie Todd on May 2017, World Hypertension Month. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please. And I call on Marie Todd to open the debate up to seven minutes, please, Ms Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I remind the Chamber that I am a pharmacist registered with the General Pharmaceutical Council? I'm also a member of the Health and Sport Committee and I'm co-convener of the Cross-Party Group on Heart and Stroke. It's because of my role in the Cross-Party Group that I was keen to bring a debate about hypertension to this chamber to highlight the condition and also to highlight the great work of Pre Professor Rianne Taus and the British Heart Foundation in researching and tackling what's known as the silent killer. As the motion states, 30% of adults in Scotland have high blood pressure and over 70,000 people in the Highlands and Islands, the area I represent, are living with it. It's very common indeed. So why do we need to raise awareness about it? We need to raise awareness because hypertension is a crucial risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And cardiovascular disease still causes more than a quarter of all deaths in Scotland, nearly 16,000 deaths a year. In particular, hypertension increases the risk of heart attack and stroke. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. So what is hypertension? Hypertension, or high blood pressure, is blood pressure that's consistently higher than the recommended level. So we would talk about hypertension being readings that are consistently equal to or more than 140 over 90 millimetres of mercury. The target level is a wee bit lower if you have diabetes. Hypertension can damage your arteries, put extra strain on the heart muscle and increase the risk of heart attack and stroke. It contributes to more than a fifth of all heart attacks and half of all strokes, and increases the risks of conditions such as renal failure and dementia. Hypertension can be prevented. Even a small decrease in blood pressure, say two over four millimetres of mercury at the population level, could significantly reduce the prevalence of stroke and heart disease. So increasing public awareness is crucial, as is access to early detection and appropriate treatment. Let me tell you about the rule of halves and how it applies to high blood pressure. Only half of the patients with high blood pressure in a population have been diagnosed. Only half of those diagnosed have been treated. And only half of those treated have been adequately treated to a normal blood pressure. One of the biggest problems for controlling high blood pressure is what we call compliance or concordance with treatment. So here's another half. As a pharmacist, I know well that only about half of the people who are prescribed medication take it as the prescriber intended. Now, given this background, I know that my community and primary care clinical pharmacists, colleagues, with their expertise in pharmaceutical care, would be able to improve outcomes for folk with hypertension. One of the particular challenges with high blood pressure is that folk don't feel ill. That's why it's called the silent killer. You don't know you have it until you get your blood pressure checked. You only feel the effect of it after some damage to the target organs has been caused. In my experience, most people would rather not take medication, especially if it causes side effects. It's pretty hard to persevere with medication, which can temporarily make you feel lousy when you felt perfectly well before you started it. Another problem is that people stop or reduce medication when their blood pressure falls to normal levels, but the condition doesn't go away. So despite there being very effective and cost-effective drugs available, target blood pressure levels are often not reached. Thankfully, in Scotland, we have free prescriptions. So whilst there may be many barriers to taking medication as prescribed, cost isn't one of them. Now, I don't want to paint too bleak a picture because we have made incredible progress, um, particularly in the last 10 years, in reducing cardiovascular morbidity and mortality rates in Scotland. But given that so many of these illnesses and early deaths are preventable, of course we want to do more. I want to highlight particularly the impact of high blood pressure on stroke. You recall that I said that it contributes to half of all strokes. Stroke is the most common cause of severe physical disability amongst adults. Half of all stroke survivors will have a disability. About 15,000 people in Scotland have a stroke every year, and up to 80% of all strokes could be prevented. 
Preventing and correctly treating hypertension is far less costly and much safer for patients than interventions that may be needed once hypertension um, has led to damage or is not treated effectively. The cause of most hypertension is unknown. In a very small number of people, there's a specific cause for the hypertension, for example, kidney disease, but mostly we don't know why someone gets it. Now, even though we don't know the cause, doing things like maintaining a healthy weight, getting regular physical activity, cutting down alcohol intake, stopping smoking, and reducing salt intake can help to maintain healthy blood pressure. The recommended daily allowance for salt intake is six grams. But in Scotland, about two thirds of us eat more than that. We politicians need to make it easy for people to do the right thing. At the moment, energy dense, high salt foods are easily available, affordable and widely accepted, making an unhealthy lifestyle the default option. It's cheap and easy to eat badly in Scotland. If only it could be cheap and easy to eat more fruit and veg. As I've said before, for many reasons, we need a programme of action that has it at its core brave, bold, fiscal and regulatory and possibly legislative measures to change our food environment. Before I finish, I want to highlight some of the really important work that the British Heart Foundation do um, in research and mention the work of Professor Rianne Towes, who works at the Research Centre across at the University in Glasgow, specialising in hypertension. Right here in Scotland, she and her team are unlocking some of the secrets of this condition and discovering some of the underlying molecular mechanisms, like the enzyme NOx5, a protein which is involved in the inflammatory process, which damages the blood vessels, <coughs> narrowing them, and therefore making blood pressure rise. Her research will not only increase our understanding, but could potentially enable the development of new therapies. I want to finish by saying World Hypertension Day was on 17th May this year, but the International Society of Hypertension are running May Measure Month. And as part of this, the British Heart Foundation has been encouraging people to know their numbers. And they're doing this by offering free blood pressure tests and type two diabetes tests at 375 Tesco stores across the UK. Blood pressure checks are also available in Superdrug there is no excuse for not knowing your numbers this month. I want to finish by reminding everyone that this common condition can be diagnosed with a very simple test. It's easy to treat. I would encourage everyone to take the opportunity this month to know your numbers. Can I have speeches of up to four minutes, please? Donald Cameron, followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Marie Todd for tabling this motion and for setting out the definition of hypertension and the difficulty, uh, as she spoke, of, of establishing what causes it. Um, she spoke about preventative me measures, and as a fellow member of the Health Committee, she will know well that we've touched on the subject of preventative health on many occasions during the session of Parliament, both in the Committee and in this Chamber. It's clear that many of the conditions that are prevalent in Scotland are largely preventable through a combined approach of improving diet, increasing physical activity and reducing stress. And I'll come back to that in a moment. However, as we know, this is easier said than done. As the motion notes, World Hypertension Month sets out to raise awareness of the condition which affects around 30% of adults in Scotland. That's almost a third of Scottish adults, a very high proportion indeed to suffer from one condition. And the motion highlights the need to understand and improve knowledge of the causes of hypertension and to highlight the need for early intervention. I want to discuss three areas individually and would like to begin by noting the need to raise awareness of this condition and the importance of people simply seeing their GP regularly, even if this is just for a checkup. As Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland notes, it is difficult to know if you have high blood pressure as there are rarely any symptoms or visible afflictions, as Marie Todd also pointed out. Hence why it is important to visit your GP or your local pharmacy where in many cases a free blood pressure check can be provided. You can also buy a digital blood pressure monitor to take regular tests at home and given the relative affordability of such kits, it's certainly a viable option for many people, although clearly not everyone. All that said though, I would like to highlight in particular the option of using a pharmacy 
particularly as we try to move care further into the community and the role of pharmacists is enhanced. It's vitally important that as people begin to use less acute services and more community-based services, we all do as much as possible to promote the services that are offered both in general practice and without it, so we are able to strike the right balance. As I stated earlier, the motion also talks about the need to understand the causes of hypertension. We know that in some cases, be it genetic or just simply growing old, preventative options are fairly limited. However, there are a variety of causes that can be dealt with through lifestyle changes. A third of adults in Scotland are obese, as we all know, and 37% of people do not meet the recommended level of physical activity. Many of these issues can often lead to high blood pressure, which can then exacerbate and result in a variety of conditions that are all too common in Scotland and that Marie Todd spoke of. Hypertension can lead to stroke, for example, with around 26,000 hospital visits and 4,300 deaths each year. Heart attacks are another end result, and this eventuality results in 25,000 hospital visits every year. These and other conditions place a heavy strain on the NHS, and it is therefore incumbent upon us all to identify solutions so that hypertension can be reduced and we can re tackle the resulting conditions. Actions speak louder than words, and my colleague Brian Whittle, I'm sure, will tell us about his ideas around a healthy lifestyle strategy, and he's already presented a document that is in no means finalised nor partisan. It's to produce a kickstart to a much-needed debate in this area around early intervention and prevention. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to close by noting that we need to have more debates on issues like World Hypertension Month. It's important that we raise awareness of these conditions, but fundamentally, it is vital that we continue to debate and discuss the much bigger picture, which is the need for early interventions and for policies that can achieve the ultimate aim to cure Scotland of the many ills that continue to burden our nation. Thank you. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking my colleague Marie Todd for securing this member's debate. Marie Todd's motion states that the month of May is Hypertension Awareness Month, and although May the 17th is the actual day, by having this debate today and raising awareness throughout the month, we can raise awareness of hypertension, which is more commonly referred to as high blood pressure. I support Marie's motion and I'd like to remind Chamber of my interest as I am currently a non-practicing nurse and I'm a member of the Chest, Heart and Stroke Cross Party Group also. High blood pressure rarely has noticeable symptoms. If it is untreated, it increases the risk of more serious problems such as cardiovascular problems, heart attacks and cerebral vascular events or strokes. The only way to find out if your blood pressure is high is have it checked regularly. A health professional, such as a doctor, nurse or healthcare support worker, can check your blood pressure easily while assessing other vital signs such as pulse, respiration rate and temperature. Many pharmacies across Scotland also have the ability to check your blood pressure and health roadshows are also a way to encourage public engagement and screening to find out if your pressure is within normal limits. There are various causes of high blood pressure. Being overweight can be a contributing factor. Too much dietary salt, as has been mentioned. Alcohol and caffeine also increase the risk of high blood pressure, and as does smoking and lack of exercise. Even lack of sleep can be a contributing factor. And it looks like I may have five out of those seven <laughs> risk factors, but I won't tell you which ones. Once diagnosed, the treatment involves pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments. Lifestyle changes with help to achieve these lifestyle changes are likely to be the first encouraged to address the factors that I've spoken about already, like smoking and diet. Some people with high blood pressure may also need to take one or more medicines to stop their blood pressure getting too high. This means seeing your GP or advanced nurse practitioner and monitoring the effects of the medications once prescribed. Studies have shown that many people don't take their antihypertensive medication regularly or at all once even prescribed, so don't omit your medications once prescribed. The health consequences of prolonged high blood pressure can be catastrophic, such as cardiovascular problems of angina to heart attack, requiring invasive procedures such as, silent, uh, such as stent placement or coronary artery bypass. The tiny wee blood vessels in your eyes can be damaged, leading to retinal disease causing blindness. 
eye tests are free in Scotland and any optometrist that provides NHS service will pr provide your eye test for free. This helps with early screening and direct referral and faster access to treatment and it can reduce the burden of GP's time. The tiny wee vessels in the kidneys don't cope with raised pressure either and can result in compromised ability of the kidneys to dialyse or filter waste products efficiently. Kidney damage leads to chronic kidney problems and electrolyte imbalance. All this contributes to further health problems potentially leading to lifelong dialysis. Presiding officer, the most high profile consequences of high blood pressure is stroke. An increased public awareness of this is very welcome. Fantastic public information campaigns such as Stroke Act Fast FAST have been very successful in highlighting symptoms and saving lives. Fast means that stroke is recognised and dealt with quickly and patients are sent to dedicated stroke centres instead of waiting for assessment in a non-specialist place. The FAST acronym is useful and worth outlining again today. F stands for face, has it fallen on one side? Arms can, can, be, can they be raised um, equally? And speech, is it slurred? And time, if you notice any of these signs, call 999 immediately. Presiding officer, I'd like to also pay tribute to the four stroke liaison nurses in NHS Dumfries and Galloway, especially Christine Cartner, because I trained with her most, more than 30 years ago. So the message is, hypertension can be detected, checked, treated and controlled. And I would urge everyone to avoid potential more complex health problems by having your blood pressure checked regularly, making lifestyle changes where necessary and don't omit taking your meds. So thank you, presiding officer. Probably time for that. Thanks. Hi, come on. Anna Sarwar to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As I rise to speak, I'm sure my thoughts and the thoughts of everyone around the chamber will continue to be with uh, our friends uh, in Manchester, particularly as we see the continued tragic stories be revealed and the victims themselves uh, be named. Just on that, as a link to this debate, I want to put on record, like Marie Todd did, our thanks to all our amazing NHS staff, whether that be our first responders or indeed our nurses, our pharmacists, our GPs and all the rest who all year round care for our fellow citizens. Um, can I thank Marie Todd for bringing this debate forward uh, today? What I like best about these debates, it gives us all an opportunity to do some research on some medical conditions that we ourselves might have and then to come and articulate our own thoughts and opinions uh, on those conditions in this chamber and hopefully attempt to raise awareness of these important issues and uh, encourage our fellow citizens to access uh, treatments and access uh, healthcare professionals to try and get an appropriate um, diagnosis. Um, I should say from listening to Emma Harper's contribution, I don't think she's alone in meeting many of the risk factors uh, in terms of uh, the risk of hypertension. I think that's probably something that it reflects the vast majority of people in this chamber, myself uh, included. I think we probably have a higher incidence rates of hypertension, high blood pressure uh, than the average population. And I'm sure our whips have nothing to do with it um, at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would, as my whip next door to me says, here, here. Um, I want to also put on, on record my thanks to, um, to Professor Ryan Toos, who has also been mentioned by uh, Marie Todd, but actually also to the British Heart Foundation who do a stellar job in terms of bringing forward these matters to this chamber and indeed uh, lobbying all sides of this chamber around the important issues affecting all things uh, the heart. Uh, Professor Ryan Toos, who is uh, based uh, at the University of Glasgow, originated from uh, Canada and leads the research project at Glasgow, the Cardiovascular Research Centre. Uh, and because of the generous support of the British Heart Foundation, uh, with a combined grant of 2.75 million is able to do that fantastic work that Marie Todd uh, set out around the uh, NOx5 enzyme that can be a leading treatment and, and prevention of hypertension, not just in Scotland, but actually can be a leading right, right around uh, the world. So I want to put on record our thanks to Professor Toys and also to the British Heart uh, Foundation. We've already heard about the risks of high blood pressure um, and the conditions that it can lead to, whether that be heart disease, heart attacks, uh, strokes, heart failure, kidney disease, uh, and so much else. Uh, and also the risk factors, which I think we need to, in terms of a public health perspective, uh, get the argument across uh, to the wider public. The family history of high blood pressure, something that I know is uh, a regular occurrence in my own household. Uh, individuals' ethnicity, 
can lead to a higher chance of having high blood pressure, a high amount of salt in your food, a lack of exercise, being overweight or obese, drinking large amounts of alcohol, smoking, or as been said before, long-term sleep deprivation as well. And I suppose the plea to people right across Scotland would be to one, recognise the symptoms, secondly, access your health centres, whether that be your GP practice and your pharmacy, and actually have your blood pressure checked. Look at your own behavioural lifestyle in terms of your diet and your salt intake, how active you are, how much alcohol you consume, whether you smoke, your caffeine intake, and getting the right level of sleep. All of things that I promised and resolved to take more interest in in my own life from this day on. So in closing, I just want to thank Marie Todd again, thank Professor Tuis for all her hard work, thank the British Heart Foundation, but above all else, thank my wife for keeping my blood pressure low. Thank you. <clears throat> I would be interested in her perspective on that, I have to say. <laughs> Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and let me, uh, like others, uh, thank Marie Todd for the opportunity uh, to discuss uh, something that probably is of interest to every one of us personally, uh, either uh, as an individual or as some uh, member of the family. Now, I'm not a regular reader of hypertension news. Uh, but the February uh, 2017 edition, uh, I read of the objective of screening 25 million people's blood pressure in May this year. Uh, and I can advise the Chamber that I have made my little contribution with a very helpful cooperation of my MSP colleague Emma Harper, who had her sphygmomanometer uh, and her stethoscope at the ready earlier today and took my blood pressure. It was not good news. But I had just come up the stairs and I hadn't sat down and done my calming down. So 158 over 70, okay on the diastolic, a wee bit high on the systolic, uh, was rather higher than the previous time I had it when it was 130 over 75, which is kind of where I'd like to be. But I'm gonna go away and think about this salt business. I might even give up drinking for a couple of days um, because <laughs> I think for each of us, there are things that we can do. But the, uh, the, the publication I referred to, Hypertension News, a lot of quite interesting articles in it. Um, it there's one article, for example, about a, a German lady, 54 years old, slim, quite fit, uh, but her blood pressure is regularly over 300 systolic and a diastolic in the 170, 180 range. Um, and she's quite healthy. Uh, and, but the drugs have stopped working for her. So therefore, it's one illustration among very many that each hypertensive uh, person is likely to be quite individual and require individual attention. The uh, publication also talked about a lot of work that's been done to try and identify DNA triggers that might create a predisposition to or which by resetting the DNA one might address. It, it's fair to say, with almost no success whatsoever, they suggest that only one milligram, which is but nothing, is beyond clinical measurement accuracy, uh, is attributable to DNA. So we don't know why it happened. And for something that affects the number of people that it does, that's really quite worrying. So I think the efforts of the Bridge Heart Foundation and others to continue research into conditions that affect the heart adversely is something we should continue to support. Because from the reading I've done, at least today, I know that we know much less than I thought we knew. And that's a bit, uh, a bit concerning. I must say, uh, as somebody whose hobbies uh, uh, family research, uh, I've read in my own family tree over 2,000 death certificates, and I'm relatively pleased to say uh, that uh, dying from heart failure is not a major one, although strokes are quite common um, in, in that. So I'm going to wait and, and have a think about that. As a private pilot, of course, I have an annual medical, uh, which includes uh, testing my blood pressure, testing my urine to see if I'm diabetic, testing my hearing, testing my eyesight, uh, and uh, an ECG. I have to say in 20, nearly 30 years, I've only had a single ectopic uh, heartbeat in my ECG, which is good news, but we've seen a steady growth in uh, my blood pressure, and that won't be uh, un un unusual. 
Um, I'll just close by saying diet, and I'm going to think about my diet, maybe salt in particular. Um, and the association in diet and hypertension is quite well known, and the Mediterranean diet is relatively well known to be one that is not associated with hypertension. And the really bad news is this week, because of weather conditions, there's an olive oil shortage. So can I encourage colleagues, there is a good substitute. It's uh, Scottish extra virgin rapeseed oil, which you can get in the northeast of Scotland in my constituency. So don't worry, we've got the solution in the northeast, even if the Italians are letting the side down by not producing enough olive oil. Uh, this is a fascinating subject. I'm sure it will run and run. I'm going to be interested to hear what Mr. Whittle's going to say in particular, because I know he's very interested in the subject. Presiding officer. Follow that. Brian Whittle to be followed by David Torrance. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I will also be interested in what Mr. Whittle's got to say, because... He hasn't written a speech down, <laughs> he's winging it. So um, I can thank Marie Todd for, for bringing this uh, subject to the, the chamber. It is something that I am extremely interested in. I think in terms of hypertension month, it's probably very pertinent to this chamber because the last month has probably raised more blood pressure uh, figures uh, than, as, as has been said, than, than, than average. And uh, I think the, the causes of, a hyper, uh, of high blood pressure is something that uh, I think has, has been mentioned quite a lot, but high blood pressure itself, which um, is really about you know, the, the, the pushing the blood uh, around the system and the heart having to work much harder to do so. Um, and, and this is dangerous, of course, because um, it, it contributes to the hardening of the arteries. Uh, it, it also continues to stroke and kidney disease and, and development of heart uh, failure, as, as has previously been stated. Um, the causes, uh, again, have been talked about. The one I'm really interested in was age, uh, and I'm wondering what that means uh, as, as I, as I uh, do my journey through my 50s. Um, obviously, family, heart, uh, history of high blood pressure. Yes, I, I, know, I know, Mr. Stevenson, I, I am buoyed by the fact you're still with us. Um, <laughs> also, what, what's, what's interesting as well was, is being African or, or Caribbean uh, or origin actually gives you a higher level uh, of, of, of instance of this. Um, then we get, into, we get into the real meat of it for me is, is high amounts of salt in your food, as Mr. Stevenson has said, um, a lack of exercise. I'm going to talk about that a lot. Uh, being overweight and obese, uh, regularly drinking large amounts of alcohol, smoking and, and, and sleep deprivation. And prevention sits within healthy diet, limiting your alcohol intake for at least two days. Mr. Stevenson, losing weight, cutting down your caffeine, which is one of my big problems, getting active and stopping smoking. So lifestyle modification is something that, uh, uh, that uh, it, it really helps with, with hypertension. And, and it's having a fallback position uh, when you're feeling stress. So I think stress is something I think we probably all uh, are aware of, especially at this time. And uh, so you need a fallback position. And my fallback position has always been to pull my kit on and go for a trot uh, around the woods, preferably with my earphones on and some nice soothing music like uh, ACDC or something like that, or um, or perhaps or perhaps uh, or perhaps plugging in my guitar and smashing out some some ACDC tracks is really <laughs> helpful as well. Um, but what I find if, if I uh, if I want to put my thoughts in order, uh, I tend not to take my, my music with me and and run and, uh, and 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 try and think the problem through. Um, which, I, which I'm trying to do more, uh, more now than I used to um, in, in this chamber. Um, but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, Deputy Presiding Officer, I put my thoughts in order, but my memory is not very good, so I immediately forget, then we go back into the house. So I have a fallback position where, uh, where I, I, I have, uh, I have uh, when I have stress related or I have a, a bit of a pressure. I often wonder what happens to those people who don't have a fallback pos position, and that tension is allowed to build. And I think that's something really where, as, as Donald Cameron's alluded to, is, is really where I've, I've focused most of my time in this chamber. And uh, I, I did try to produce uh, a, a document earlier on this year that was very apolitical. Um, apart from the front cover, which said Conservatives, there was no mention of any politics in it <laughs> after that. And some of the things that, uh, that, that, that I would really like to look at, is, as has been said before, is how do we make uh, fresh fruit and, and vegetables more widely available 
across all demographics? And how do we encourage, it's not just making them available, how do we encourage uh, those fruit and vegetables to be taken? Uh, uh, physical education is obviously a, a, a huge one for me. Physical education is about uh, giving people the tools for life to understand what physical, what physical activity does um, uh, for the quality of life. Um, and I think that's something, certainly a, a, an educational intervention we're looking at there. And echoing the RCPE is uh, physical activity should be embodied into primary care, secondary care, social care and health education, as well as into health and social care workforce and, and workplace. And making sure that the highest nutritional value of meals should be the primary objective of food procurement policy, because we do have a, a, an issue in, in Scotland and uh, around our health. And the preventative agenda is something that I'm really keen on. And as I said, I'll stop there and just say, because I could go on for a long time, uh, DPO, <laughs> to thank Marie Todd for bringing this to the chamber. Thank you. I was beginning to realise that, Mr. Whittle. <laughs> I call David Torrance to be followed by the last of the open speeches, which is Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I say I played my part earlier this month as well when I was given a monitor away for a day and um, I handed it in the next day and the doctor phones me and says, you peaked at 240 over 190. And I went, oh, right. He says, can you tell me where you were at half past seven that night? I says, at my branch meeting. <laughs> so there is the clue, <laughs> President Officer. Do not go to your branch meeting. <laughs> your blood pressure will be all right. <laughs> can, I, can I also like, I would like to thank Marie Todd for bringing this motion to Parliament today to recognise World Hypertension Month. That raises awareness for those suffering from stroke and heart condition. It's also crucial to recognise not only those who are affected by high blood pressure, but those who remain undiagnosed by a silent condition. The International Society for Hypertension presents an ambitious goal through our Blood Pressure Awareness Campaign, May Measurement Month, to screen 25 million people who have not had their blood pressure measured for over a year. This means screening an average of 100 people in 100 sites in 100 countries every day throughout the month of May. This is an ambitious yet achievable goal that can be reached by working together we can make a difference to the biggest single contributor to global death. 60 million people in the UK have high blood pressure, one third of these people do not know they have it. As high blood pressure really has any symptoms, these people are also three times more likely to develop heart disease and stroke. High blood pressure is entirely preventable, one of the most preventable conditions, but still remains one of the leading causes of death in the UK. We face complex challenges to prevent and control hypertension, both globally and nationally. And I hope that the data collected during the World Hypertension Month can be used to support research on a national, regional and global level. There's only one way to identify blood pressure, by having a GP or other health professional measure it. This is why we need to educate people and increase awareness. Hypertension risk varies with income. Those with lower social economic status are much more likely to develop heart conditions when those are wealthier and generally better educated. The risk persists even with the long-term progress in addressing main risk factors such as smoking and high cholesterol. That is why local, low social economic status needs to be regarded as a heart disease risk factor and it's owned by a medical community as well as a political community, as these effects are cumulative. Among women especially, it has been proven that levels of high blood pressure increase as income decreases. According to the British Heart Foundation, women are less likely to seek medical attention and treatment despite the warning signs. The risk of heart disease and the menopause are correlated and risk continues to increase with age. Women's hormones may provide some protection from heart disease, but post-menopause, the risk rises. It is crucial for women to recognise the symptoms. Heart disease kills more than twice as many women as breast cancer every year, yet it remains to be perceived by society as a man's disease. The Women in Hypertension Research Network was established to encourage, support and inspire women in science and medicine in the field of hypertension and related heart conditions, and creates avenues for women to communicate, collaborate and educate. In 2016, in Scotland, 30% of those tested had high blood pressure. This number is higher than five, with 39% of those tested having high blood pressure. Keep Well Clinics, a Scotland-wide programme, seek to reduce the risk of ill health, and there are several clinics across five where community nurses can measure blood pressure. Despite the tremendous services provided by the NHS, heart disease can place a massive emotional burden and create serious financial stress. In Scotland, Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland and Citizens Advice Bureau 
have appointed free benefit advisors to help give advice and information about social security benefits to people in need of assistance. In conclusion, presiding officers, I applaud the efforts by those involved in the World Hypertension Month to improve the population's overall health. We need to prevent people from developing high blood pressure in the first place by encouraging better diet, exercise and reducing stress. I hope that initiatives bring together communities, healthcare professions, health systems, non-profit organisations, charities and private sector partners to improve care and empower the Scottish, Scottish population to make the hearty, healthy choices. The last of the open speakers is Colin Smith. Th thank you, President Officer. Can I echo other members in thanking uh, Mary Todd for tabling this motion and allowing us the opportunity to play our part in raising awareness uh, during uh, World Hypertension Month, and in particular, stressing the dangers of this silent killer. Can I also thank the British Heart Foundation for their excellent briefing, which was very helpful in preparing for today's debate, but also for all the work they do in leading the fight against heart disease, and also echo the comments of others and paying tribute to our healthcare workforce today of all days. As has been mentioned, hypertension or, or high blood pressure, as it is more commonly known, affects almost 30% of the adult population in Scotland. It's a crucial risk factor in cardiovascular disease, which causes more than a quarter of deaths in Scotland each, each year. In fact, it's estimated that 670,000 people are currently living with cardiovascular disease in Scotland at a cost to a health service of £800 million a year. As well as being a major cause of cardiovascular disease, hypertension also has a significant impact on the risk of developing other serious conditions. It contributes to more than a fifth of all heart attacks and half of all strokes and increases the risk of someone developing conditions such as renal failure and dementia. However, despite the huge risks associated with hypertension, around 7 million people across the UK are currently living with undiagnosed high blood pressure. And of the 30% of adults in Scotland living with hypertension, half are not receiving any treatment. Of those who are diagnosed, one in six are not treated effectively enough to reduce their blood pressure to target levels. Not surprisingly, therefore, the British Heart Foundation recommend that everyone over 40 should have their blood pressure checked, which, looking around, probably uh, means most of us in the chamber today. There have been government-backed campaigns to encourage people to have their blood pressure checked, but many health professionals rightly argue that these can often succeed in encouraging mainly the worried well to have checks, rather than those most at risk of developing cardiovascular disease, particularly those who live in the most deprived communities and are victims of the inverse care law. No more than ever, we need creative solutions to this significant health challenge to ensure that those most at risk receive the diagnosis and treatment that they need. Our GPs will remain the first port of call for many people seeking health care and health advice. But we all know that our GPs in almost every area of the country are stretched beyond capacity. We not only need to build the capacity within our GP surgeries and make sure we tackle the chronic shortage of doctors, but also consider other services to ensure that everyone is made aware of the importance of checking their own blood pressure or having that blood pressure checked. Extending blood pressure checks from the GP surgery into more community pharmacies and more community outreach services could go some way to reaching those most at risk of hypertension. And I'd ask the Minister when summing up today to say whether this is an approach the government is encouraging and what other measures the government intends to take to overcome the current barriers to the diagnosis of hypertension. Preventing and correctly treating hypertension is, of course, far less costly than interventions that may be needed when hypertension is not diagnosed or treated effectively. Maintaining a healthy weight, getting regular physical exercise, cutting down alcohol in intake and reducing salt in our diet can all go some way towards a healthy blood pressure. But as we know today, as Donald Cameron highlighted, two-thirds of adults in Scotland are now overweight, with more than a fifth of children in Scotland at risk of being overweight or obese by the time they reach school. Determined measures are therefore needed. So I'd once again urge the government that when the new obesity strategy is published later this year, it includes firm action on unhealthy supermarket promotions and restrictions on multi-buy discounts on unhealthy food so that the healthy choice becomes a cheaper option for Scotland's families. But reducing our calorie intake alone is not enough to mitigate the risk of hypertension. As Stuart Stevenson and Brian Whittle both highlighted, two-thirds of adults in Scotland still eat too much salt, despite a reduction in recent years. So cutting the amount of salt in our diet, as well as increasing physical exercise, are also key measures to maintaining healthy blood pressure. 
presiding officer, in concluding, I want to once again thank Mary Todd for the opportunity to debate this important issue and maybe given the demographics of most of the chamber today, including myself, reiterate once again the importance of getting our blood pressure checked. As Mary Todd said, it's important that we know our numbers. And if those numbers are as high as Stuart Stevenson's and David Torrance's, we need to also make sure we get the help and support that we need. Thank you. I now call on young Aileen Campbell to, <laughs> to respond to this debate. I was, Around I was seven minutes, please. Thank you. Minister. I was going to address that late, uh, later on in my, in my remarks, but for the record and for Colin Smith's information, I think myself, Anna Sarwar, Monica Lennon, anyone else? Tom? Sorry, I don't want to offend anyone else. We're all under 40, so I think <laughs> maybe, it's that, maybe it's that lack of sleep that we all suffer from that you've uh, misunderstood those uh, sleep lines for uh, age lines. Thank you. A point of order. <laughs> um, but again, more seriously, presiding officer, and, and firstly, before we, I go into the uh, debate around hypertension, I, I want, like others, Anna Sarwar and others, uh, also put on record and pay tribute to all health and social care professionals doing so much to help those devastated by the brutal effects of what happened in Manchester last night. And our thoughts and prayers remain with everyone in Manchester and our gratitude, of course, to the brave staff doing what they can to help others. Uh, returning now back to the, the debate of hypertension, President Officer, I am also pleased to take this opportunity to raise awareness of hypertension and the work in preventing and treating it by the Scottish Government, NHS uh, Scotland and others. And of course, thank Marie Todd for bringing the debate tonight to the Chamber. I'd specifically like to thank, when I say others, um, British Heart Foundation, who are an active contributor to our National Advisory Committee for Heart Disease and a partner in our out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy. Um, British Heart Foundation, of course, do so much in terms of research. And recently, I had the real pleasure of visiting the uh, Heart Foundation's uh, Centre of Research Excellence at the University of Edinburgh uh, in Little France uh, earlier this year. And also, again, recognise the work of Professor Rianne Toys uh, and the from the Institute of Cardiovascular and Medical Sciences, eminent in the field of hypertension, and will no doubt continue to inform our approach to this uh, condition. Um, as others have reflected on what hypertension is and its impact on people, it often has no symptoms, but is a risk for heart disease and stroke, major causes of death in Scotland, which could be prevented. And that's been a crucial point throughout Marie Todd's uh, opening remarks and also of Donald Cameron's and others, uh, that devastating uh, knowledge that so many of Scotland's poor health outcomes can be avoided, costly in terms of the public purse, but also in what it means for someone who is suffering. And overall, 28% of people in Scotland have high blood pressure. And we know that prevalence increases sharply with age. Almost two thirds of people over 75 years have high blood pressure. It's heartening that there was a significant decrease in high hypertension in the Scottish population from 33 to 28% from 2011 to 13. And that has remained level since, but we continue to take actions that will contribute to further lowering the incidence rates. In Scotland, there is a high prevalence of the risk factors for hypertension. I'll talk some more about our action to tackle it, that uh, lifestyle modification that Brian Whittle and others have already mentioned in their remarks. But I want to highlight our approach in diagnosing and man ma managing hypertension in primary care, because we do expect GPs to consider routinely checking the blood pressure of people without symptoms or existing conditions aged over uh, 40. And in addition, GPs with their staff will check blood pressures when they see patients with a wide variety of symptoms. And this can be as part of monitoring of people with a long-term uh, condition, such as hypertension itself, diabetes, as well as those who have experienced a stroke. And we're also raising awareness of hypertension so people know what they can do. NHS Inform has information on prevention symptoms, uh, uh, diagnosis, treatment and complications, and who to ask for help. For NHS Scotland, clinical staff Heart E and STARS, both part funded by Scottish Government, offer e-learning resources in cardiovascular disease risk management, including hypertension. And it's our population health improvement actions on alcohol, on diet, physical activity and tobacco use that will also contribute to reducing the incidence of high blood pressure. And prevention is a key part of not just our approach around hypertension, but it's also a key part and plank of our uh, health and social care delivery plan, our national clinical strategy and uh, the realistic medicine approach uh, outlined by our chief medical officer. And to give Colin Smith some comfort around what he was looking for, around looking and exploring all avenues to identify 
uh, high blood pressure. Uh, one example is the, is the need for annual checks which we around for uh, for our diabetes which we promoted through, promoted through our community pharmacy campaign the nine checks for that which includes uh, blood pressure so again that's just using all avenues and all ways in which we can promote a uh, good positive health outcomes but also making sure that we have tangible things that community pharmacists and other health professionals can do to help uh, increase uh, good health uh, limiting, of course, uh, alcohol consumption can also lower, lower the risk of developing hypertension. Our alcohol strategy framework for action has a package of over 40 measures to reduce consumption, encourage more positive attitudes and choices and improve treatment and support services. A refreshed alcohol strategy will be introduced in summer this year and will focus on embedding and building on that framework. We believe and continue to believe that a minimum unit price for alcohol as part of a concerted range of measures is the most effective and efficient way to tackle alcohol misuse in Scotland. Minimum pricing will target heavy drinkers as they tend to drink the cheap high strength alcohol that will be most affected by this policy. And we're continued to be dis disappointed by the delay to minimum unit pricing by, uh, but remain committed to it and will continue to defend the policy at the Supreme Court. We've given an undertaking not to implement minimum unit pricing until the judicial process is fully determined. And if the Supreme Court finds in our favour, we will seek to implement that measure as soon as possible. We also know that a poor diet also increases risk of high blood pressure and are investing in a range of programmes to improve diets in Scotland. We're promoting healthy eating as a simple, affordable choice for all in Scotland through our Eat Better, Feel Better social marketing uh, campaign. We fund the Healthy Living Awards and Healthy Living Programme, supporting caterers and retailers to make healthy choices more easily available through provision of guidance, support and training. And of course, we'll be bringing forward our diet and obesity strategy and learn the lessons of those bold measures we've taken around alcohol and smoking, uh, where it has made a real impact and made the impact that we desire. And again, that was point, those were points raised by Marie Todd and Colin Smith. But it's not just uh, what we eat and drink that can help reduce the risk of developing hypertension. What we do makes a real difference as well. And being active has many health benefits and can reduce, reduce the risk of developing hypertension and other chronic conditions. And a fifth of adults in Scotland are inactive, but addressing this requires uh, lots of action by many of our partners. And we'll continue to to put effort and work into this and to do something in all settings as set out in the Toronto Charter for Physical Activity. And of course, not smoking, in addition to the many other health benefits, can help reduce the risk of developing hypertension and other illnesses. And we'll continue our efforts to reduce the number of people who smoke. So we, uh, of course, welcome the contribution of those seeking to raise awareness of hypertension. We'll continue uh, to remain committed to ensuring the NHS builds on its commendable achievements in de detecting and treating people with hypertension and learn where we can do more and in including raising awareness as others have done today uh, in this debate. Today's debate has been informative uh, and we've raised uh, collectively as a parliament awareness of hypertension and should continue to work across party political lines in order to do so. We've also learned that Stuart Stevenson uh, likes to read death certificates. We've also learned that Brian Whittle uh, has often found, can often be found running in the woods, listening to ACDC. And of course, David Torrance uh, continues to avoid branch meetings. So we've learned an awful lot today, but, we've, but more seriously, alongside the work that I've outlined around our um, uh, preventative measures that we're taking to ensure people can lead healthier lifestyles, we'll continue to pursue action for pre pre for prevention to reduce the risk of people in Scotland developing hypertension in the future, contributing to better outcomes, quality of life and ultimately the healthier Scotland that I know we all wish to see regardless of the political party that we're here to represent. So again, just put on record my thanks to Marie Todd and others for contributing fully to this important debate. So thank you. I close this meeting.